We've built a really weird game so far. Some parrots wander around the world. We can control our pirate captain character and point them towards the treasure. But when the two meet, nothing happens at all. When objects in a game come into contact with each other, we call this a collision. And so the process of identifying if two objects have collided is called collision detection. This is something we need to build. We want our pirate captain to collect the treasure, in other words, we want the treasure to disappear, when they collide. The trick with this is to always make sure that you add the collision detection code to the object that does not disappear. And this makes some sort of sense. We wouldn't put all of the instructions on what to do during a collision on the thing that's going to vanish, would we? In our case, it's our pirate who's not disappearing, so we're going to jump back into that code. And we still need to be in the act method, that's the code that runs every frame of the game, but we need now to go underneath the movement code that we just added. Find or create a bit of blank space underneath it, but still within the curly braces of the act method, and put your new code here. So what are we doing? Well, whilst it looks like the pirate should be able to see the treasure, on a code level, the poor pirate is actually seeing this. Nothing. Nada. Zip. Remember, the point of object orientation is that the objects keep their own methods and properties. So, unless the objects are introduced to each other and are programmed to be able to interact, then they simply cannot interact at all. In fact, they can't even see each other. What we need to do is to introduce the pirate to the treasure so they can interact. The way in which we do this is by letting the object know what type of object it needs to know about. In our case, we need to let the pirate know that it will be interacting with a treasure object. And we get this from the subclass name. And it has to be identical, capitalization included. We pop that into the code and we've told the pirate that it will be interacting with treasure. However, now there's another problem. When we've got more than one object of the same type to interact with, in this case, lots of treasure, then how does the pirate know which instance of the actor to care about? In other words, which treasure has it currently collided with? In this example, I want the treasure chest that my pirate has collided with to be the actor that we're referencing when we want to manipulate this. The way we do this is quite straightforward. We just need to tell the program that the treasure we care about is the one that our pirate happens to be overlapping. There's a function for this in Greenfoot, but it takes a little fiddling with. It's got a great descriptive name again, get one object at offset, and has three arguments. The offset X and Y values, and the type of object we want to find. The offset's a little bit strange because we need to give the X and Y coordinates of where the object that we will be overlapping is in relation to the position of the pirate. Now this means that we treat the position of the pirate wherever she happens to be as 0, 0. Here the treasure is a 2-1 offset from the pirate, but this isn't the treasure we care about. We only care about it when the pirate is overlapping with the treasure like this. And in that case, the X and Y offsets are both zero. They are on top of each other. That never changes when we're programming this. It will always be zero, zero. Uh, but there you go. Now we've said that we only care about an object that is overlapping us. But what is this type of object? Well, let's take a look. We know it's treasure, but we can check that back in the main window. It's treasure with a capital T and the object type is a class, so it's treasure.class. Of course, whatever type of object it was, it would be the name.class. That goes in as the third argument. Let's get that into the code then. Fantastic. So, we've introduced the pirate to the treasure and identified which treasure chest is overlapping it. The next problem is quite simple. The pirate just doesn't know what world it's currently in. Just like previously, she had no idea what objects were around her. We need to provide the pirate with a map and, in code, tell the actor which world they're in. Now, this code seems like we've missed something. 
you might be expecting a dot in the middle. Not so. Get world is not a function based off the world class name. In fact, the world class name is acting as a cast to give the world that we find some context. If you're wondering what casting is, have a think back to what you learnt about programming and it's about telling the computer in advance what type of data that object should be. The world's class name is just the name of the world class as we see it here in the main interface. Our world is called Island, so we've just got to drop that into our code snippet. Hooray! So, we need to actually store that as a variable though, and we need that world class name again. And then a unique name for the world we're in, just something that we can use to refer to it in our code. Now, it really doesn't matter what this is, but it's worthwhile giving it a descriptive name. And the style of the variable name the exam board use is just to use the world class name entirely in lowercase. Confusing? Certainly, but it's just a variable name. Let's combine that into one line. Great. And now get that into our code. A little complicated so far. Our next job is to decide what to do if we are colliding with the treasure. So far, all we've done is made some introductions. We have two variables, island, which is the world we're in, and treasure, which is the exact treasure object that we are overlapping. Let's see what's happening with that overlapping object variable as the game is played. You'll see here that the default state of the variable is null. Null means the absence of something, so it's basically showing us that we're not overlapping anything. Eventually, we collide with the treasure chest and the variable is set. If we move away, the variable shows null again, because it's not overlapping with anything. How does this help us in code? Well, it's pretty obvious that if the variable is null, then there's nothing colliding with it. And we don't need to do anything about it if it's null. So we need to say that if it is not null, then we need to do something. That's what this code is about. The exclamation mark and the equal sign means not equal to. The object we're looking for is that variable we've set up for the treasure. What do we call that? Oh yes, treasure, capital T. Let's see what that looks like in the if statement. Seems to make sense. Let's update the condition in our code block. We have an interaction model now. We've got an if statement that activates when the pirate has collided with the treasure. The problem is that we've not yet told it what to do if that actually happens, and it means that in the game proper, our pirate isn't collecting anything when it collides with it. Let's take a look at our OOP diagram to understand the interaction model we're working on so far. So, the pirate overlaps the treasure. We need to tell that treasure to disappear. The problem is that the treasure has no method to remove itself. Now, even if we go and write one, this will be the wrong place to put it. The sneaky thing here is that the world is also an instance of the world class. It has properties and methods of its own. One of the methods happens to allow it to remove an object from the world. Now that's exactly what we need. We want the pirate to tell the world to use its remove object method to remove the treasure. The world will then target the treasure and remove the instance of it from the world we're in, making that object vanish. But how do we do that in code? Well. In order to tell the world to remove the object, we'll need to use this method, remove object, which needs to work on the world we're in, and that's the variable name we've already set for the world. This was our island, lowercase i, so that goes at the start. The argument to this method is the object we're overlapping, the instance of the treasure that we want to remove. Luckily, that's something we've already set up and is our treasure variable. This line of code simply goes in the curly braces of the if statement. So that's it, mostly. Let's get it compiled. Yep, fine, no problems. Now let's run it and see if it works. Go on, pirate captain. Let's see what happens when you eventually get to that treasure chest. She'll get there. Go on. The tension's too much for me, but boom, she's done it. We've done it. Our next step will be to add a sound effect now. This is something that's ridiculously easy, but I fancied getting another video out of it. You'll feel a bit short-changed if you tune in next week expecting this level of detail. <laughs>